Welcome to the Mullen Automotive Museum. I'm Ricky Bursch. I'm a docent here, been here about 10 years. And today we're going to be looking at one of our uh, special gems in our collection, the 1935 Wasson Aerodine. This car actually won Best in Show at Pebble Beach in 2011. And today to help us walk through and understand about this car is one of our, my fellow docents here, one of our great docents, uh, Dave Butchko. And Dave is here to uh, walk us through and tell us all about this beautiful automobile. Well, Welcome, thanks, Ray. Ray. My place. Great to be here. Uh, well, one of the things I love about being here at the Mullen Automotive Museum is that it's all about the stories, and the stories go so much beyond just the cars themselves. And one of the things that I'm particularly fascinated by are the people behind some of these wonderful cars and, and who they were and, and the decisions that they made. And the story of Voisin really starts with uh, Gabriel Voisin uh, and his brother, Charles. Uh, but with Gabriel, he was born in 1880. Um, hmm. By 1900, he really got interested in aviation and drawing of flying machines, which was, you know, a fascination for everybody on both sides of the Atlantic at that point. Hmm. By 1906, Gabriel and his brother Charles and a childhood friend had established their own aircraft company hmm. that uh, translated in English to the Voisin Brothers Aviation, hmm. and they started building airplanes. Hmm. And... Um, mostly focusing on commercial aircraft at the time. Mm -hmm. And within a few years, they'd established themselves reasonably well. But in 1912, a couple of very seminal things happened, which really shifted Voisin and uh, their fortunes. One was that his brother, Charles, was killed in an automobile accident. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that, as I've read, is that Charles was really the, the business brains of the operation. And you wonder mm -hmm. what would have happened had that had Charles not passed at that point what the future trajectory mm -hmm. of the Voisin companies sure. and the Voisin brothers could have been. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that happened in 1912, though, was that Gabriel realized that the only people really buying airplanes in any kind of volume to make a business was the military. Uh -huh. And so that's what his focus became. Mm -hmm. And then by the First World War, um, the French war ministry decided that they were going to use a Voisin design and put it out for other manufacturers as well mm. to build. And so basically, they were building bombers, effectively. And, um, and so Voisin him, themselves, they built about 3,000 bombers mm. and wow. aircraft for the military. Uh, together, their design, though, and the other companies was about 10,000 planes. Mm. And so by the end of the war, though, um, again, Voisin had an, Gabriel Voisin had an epiphany. And he decided that, um, I think, because they were bombers that they were building, and he recognized that the, um, the targeting um, accuracy of those early bombers was basically equivalent to, hey, over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he recognized that there was a lot of collateral damage being caused by these planes. Huh? And every, all those lessons that he learned about aircraft in terms of aerodynamics, such as they were, you know, without mm -hmm. modern wind tunnels and computers and all of mm -hmm. that, um, really did translate into the cars that he was making. Mm -hmm. and in fact, you can see here on the front of every one of Voisin's cars, they have the logo, which reads Avion Voisin, which was, mm -hmm. of course, Avion, of course, is French for aircraft. And so, again, that spirit uh, continued. Mm -hmm. And you can even see here that almost all the Voisin cars that I've seen, certainly, and maybe you've seen mm -hmm. others that do not, have these wonderful struts here on the front of the car mm -hmm. that are actually inverted wings. Mm -hmm. So um, again, paying homage to the aircraft lineage of the company and the cars themselves. And I'm not sure how much aerodynamic downforce they really <laughs> created, but it certainly gave it that look and that, um, you know, that connection to sure. the company's past. Is there another functional use to these in terms of holding up the fenders? Or well, I imagine that there was probably some stability that was mm -hmm. added here, mm -hmm. given the, you know, the age of these cars and where things were back then. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing that you'll see on a lot of the Voisin cars that I think is interesting is this novel approach to a hood ornament or mm -hmm. a radiator mascot. Mm -hmm. You know that, you know, if we look around the museum, you see a lot of those wonderful uh, jewel-like Lalique mm -hmm. uh, radiator mascots that were designed and sold. That one was clearly done by an engineer. And under the hood, as you can see here, is a, an inline six-cylinder engine. It was common at the time. This is actually an aluminum block motor, and you can see cooling fins in the head. And um, it is, 
it uses technology known as a, it's a night sleeve valve engine. And uh, the Knight sleeve valve engine was actually patented by an American named Charles Knight in 1908 and used by a number of manufacturers in the early days. And Voisin was definitely a devotee of the sleeve valve design. And uh, the sleeve valve was really interesting because it didn't use any valves overhead to open and close for intake and exhaust. It actually used a sleeve in each cylinder that moved up and down and had openings that would allow you know, fuel and air to come in and exhaust to go out, and a really sort of novel design. The, uh, Voisin liked it because it um, produced more horsepower than a typical engine of the time. Um, you know, today you wouldn't say 103 horsepower is a, a, a lot, but back then it was quite significant. And they were also very, very quiet because, you know, as you can imagine, uh, valve trains of the day in the, in the early part of the automotive era were very noisy, clattery and whatever, and some people didn't like that. So the sleeve valve engine was quite quiet. It did, however, have one significant drawback, and that was it used a lot of oil. And um, in fact, some said that, you know, you had to, with a, an engine like this, you would pull into a, a fuel station, a gas station to, you know, check the, you know, check the gas and, and, and refill the oil. But, um, and so ultimately, it, you know, it, it was one of those things that, that didn't take off in the, in the main. But even as far as 1935, Voisin was still using that design, which I think is really sort of interesting. One of the things about this car, though, and it shows sort of, um, we can get into the design here a little bit later on, but one of the things about this car is that, while, you know, it, this was the 30s, so it was Depression era, and money for everybody was tight. And so while this, the Aerodemes especially, had this really wonderful modern, streamlined, modern, if you will, design to it in the exterior, the, the uh, chassis and the running gear was pretty much a carryover from earlier cars. There's really nothing terribly innovative about this engine, which had been used in other cars, or the suspension uh, and chassis setup of this particular car. Now, I noticed the hood here. Yeah. That is aluminum. Is the entire car aluminum? Yeah, it's an aluminum body, um, which he liked for, uh, for weight, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, all those cars back then were body on frame. Well, we have a real special treat because we're going to open the door of this car and I'm going to take you on a little tour of the interior. Well, we're inside the beautiful Aerodine and the first thing you notice when you sit behind the wheel and look at the dash, this looks just like an aeroplane. It has more kinds of bells and whistles and dials of things for uh, the pilot actually to control. Starting on the right, we'll start all the way over here. There's a little black knob. There's actually your turn signals for the left and right turn signals. And then these are two really interesting features right here that not many cars have and you probably see in a lot of modern cars today. These actually adjust your suspension as you're driving. So you can tighten or loosen both the front or the rear as you're driving based upon the road conditions that you have. Uh, Gabriel Wasson did not want to actually have a lot of extra equipment on his car, and he says, you know, a starter turns one way and a generator turns the other. What if you had one unit that could work both as a starter and a generator? So when you go through starting this car, there's actually about 23 things you have to do to get this car started. And number seven is you got to pull this switch out after you get the car running, and it turns the starter into the generator. Now, you got to be careful when you do that, because if you don't do it at the right time, you can blow the entire electrical system. And Mr. Mullen doesn't like it when I do that. <laughs> Over here, you have the parking brake, and you have what's basically a two-speed transmission that has reversed, so it's three-speed in that regard, and it has uh, an overdrive. If you can see the pedals on the floor, they all have Gabriel Wasson's initials on them, and he did that in all of his cars. And the throttle is basically, looks like a throttle that you would see on every other Bugatti. It's just basically a lever with a roller ball bearing on it. So when your foot touches it, it moves with, with, uh, your, uh, with your foot. As we continue across the dash here, uh, next to the two gauges over here, you will see the tachometer. And you will see another button. These are for the interior lights. Uh, this is a, a switch that works the heater. 
And then you have these two round units here that have smaller circular units in them. These are the fuses that operate the car. Now, going back to the aeronautical design features of Gabrielle, uh, where would you want the fuses in an airplane? You would want them in the airplane inside because you just can't pull the plane over to the side of the road and change your fuse. Right to the right behind it is the windshield wiper motor. And again, if you can see the windshield and the double uh, wiper blades, they're connected to this one motor like you would see on an airplane with a rod that connects them together. Okay? Uh, if you can take a look at the door, you might see the door has these beautiful ashtrays on them. These ashtrays are Lalique ashtrays, and there's one on each door. One of the things Gabrielle Wasson liked were piano hinges. So there's a lot of piano hinges on all the doors, the hood, the trunk. Uh, very, very uh, useful, but also very simple. And they kind of relate to this Art Deco movement of form and function. So they're beautiful, they look great, but they're very functional. The roof also has uh, what some people might think were uh, sunroof uh, windows in it, but they're not. They're actually windows that uh, when the top recedes, you stop the top at a certain level, and then you have the window that lines up with the rear window so you can actually see out. This roof, this whole panel, will actually slide all the way back, and in fact slide all the way down these rails, all the way to the end there, as you can see, to essentially allow the entire interior of the car then to be open mm. to, the, uh, to the sky, if you will. And so we see inside the interior of the car on the back, it's actually reasonably roomy. Rick, you, you're about what, um, six foot two, is that right? 2.1 meters. 2.1 meters, there you go, for our, our European friends. And you can see there that um, eh, it's a bit of a tight squeeze, but uh, maybe, maybe not good for a long road trip. Now, one of the things, I actually saw this car at Pebble Beach in 2011 when it won Best in Show, and one of the things that caught everybody's attention was this wild upholstery. And uh, you can imagine that, that trying to restore a car like this and trying to replicate uh, upholstery like this would be really, really difficult to do. And if you were especially a person like Peter Mullen who really wanted uh, to pay particular attention to detail and you really wanted the car to be as close to original as possible, this would create a really interesting challenge. But uh, Peter was actually able to find the original looms upon, in France upon which this upholstery had been woven back in 1934 and 35. And not only that, but they were able to find, I love this in terms of craftsmanship, they were able to find two of the original loom operators who actually would have worked the loom back then in 1934 and 35 to create this upholstery. So it's not what you would say is original upholstery, but boy, it comes about as darn close as you could possibly get to the original upholstery in a, in a modern restoration, which is just a wonderful part of the story of this car. Well, we have another special treat for you today. We've opened the trunk on the Aerodine, and there's some really interesting things to see back here. Uh, first of all, on the right side, which would be the driver's side, you can see there's two pumps and some mechanism. Those pumps are the pumps I mentioned earlier that actually operate the top, and so the top can recede back. Those pumps run off of vacuum from the engine, and then they turn this gear that actually recedes the top back. The 1935 uh, C25 Aerodine from Voisin. Actually made its debut at the Paris Motor Show in 1934. Mm -hmm. And um, when you look at the car, it's so radically different from anything else that, that you, people would have seen up till that point. The, you know, there were different versions of the C25. The Aerodine was this very particular uh, version. There, were, there was a two-door uh, sports car that we see also here in the collection as well as this wonderful four-door. And unfortunately, only about six of these four-doors were made, and I believe about four of them exist to, to this day. One of the challenges, I think, that a lot of manufacturers in Europe, but even in the United States faced, was, of course, that in the, during the Depression, there really wasn't much of a demand for very expensive cars. And this was about an 80,000 franc car at the time in, in Paris. And so uh, it was a fairly pricey car. And there just wasn't much of a demand for cars at that price, which made it kind of a tough sell. Voisin, um, like a lot of manufacturers, 
of the time in the, in the late night, in the late teens and into the twenties and such, um, got into motorsports because it was a great way to get your name out there and to get known. But I think in his true heart of hearts, from what I've read and heard, um, Voisin wasn't really a motorsports guy. It was a means to an end for him. Um, but one of the things that they, they learned obviously at the time was that, you know, like, like today on any car you see on a racetrack, um, when it comes to things like the brakes, that heat is your enemy. And so because we're covering the wheel and restricting the airflow, which again helps for aerodynamics, it means that cooling the brakes becomes more of a challenge. So you'll notice that there are actually vents that, that are bi-directional here on these skirts or spats or whatever you want to call them. In front, they're open forward so that air can pass into and over the wheel to help cool the brake as you're driving along. And then along the back, they're open toward the rear of the car to allow hot air and such to escape and, and move away from the, the wheels and the brakes. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for the opportunity for, uh, to share this wonderful car, this Best in Show winner from the 2011 Pebble Beach Concours, the Voisin C25 Aerodine. Well, thank you so much for coming and opening the car up to us and showing it to us and explaining all the little details. Uh, it's really wonderful. And I certainly enjoyed working with you as a docent. I'm so glad you're here. And thanks for thank being you. part of it. If there is a particular car in the museum that you think you would like to see, let us know, and we'll try to do our best to uh, work that into our schedule. Uh, anyway, I just add one other interesting uh, recommendation, that if you're coming to the museum in the future, you might want to call ahead if there's one particular car that you'd like to see. Our cars are in and out, uh, going all over the world to shows and in uh, museums. So you just want to make sure that you uh, know that the car's here if there's one particular car you want to see. Anyway, thank you again for uh, joining us, and we look forward to seeing you for many, many shows in the future. And so from the Mullen Automotive Museum, I'm Rick Evers. I want to say thank you again and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Hi, I'm standing here in our Carlo Bugatti Furniture Gallery. It's part of the Mullen Automotive Museum's beautiful collection of Art Deco and earlier antique furnishings. Carlo Bugatti was Ettore's father and also Rembrandt's father. And we've got our Art of Bugatti book, which primarily features B uh, the Bugatti automobiles, but there are also some beautiful photographs of some of the Carlo Bugatti furnishings and some of Rembrandt's beautiful sculptures. You can find this book on our website at mullenautomotivemuseum.com.